We're going to solve a problem uh, that involves using this rule, the Faraday-Maxwell equation, where we're taking the form where the derivative with respect to time is taken outside so that we're getting the rate of change of the magnetic flux. Remember that this equation, to be meaningful, you have to give a relationship between ds, the elements of length around the closed contour, closed loop, and the element of area, dA, and it's they're related by the right hand rule. If you put your fingers in the direction of ds, then the area vector points in the direction of the thumb. Okay, so let's see what the problem is. The problem says you have a cylinder, let's say it's some kind of cylindrical uh, object uh, just to hold the wire. I mean, it's just a piece of cardboard, for instance, whatever. And then you have, you wrap a wire around this cylinder and uh, it's a finite wire. But of course, we're going to assume that it's very long um, so that we can use the approximation for the infinite, uh, the, the ideal solenoid equation. Uh, so in the drawing, it's just a small finite wire, but in reality, we, exp we consider it to be a very long uh, solenoid. And uh, we just drew it this way to give an illustration of how things work. And you have a current in this wire, and the current is not constant. It's actually changing with time. It's I max times cosine omega t. I max is just a constant, but then you have the cosine omega t, which may, means that it makes the current change with time. So sometimes the current is positive. It means it's going this way. Sometimes it's negative. It's going this way. So the current keeps on oscillating with time. And uh, we, may, we, we define uh, some radius r, and this blue uh, line just indicates a circle. It doesn't mean there's any wire there. That there has, doesn't have to be any wire on this blue circle. It could be just empty space. And we're asking the question, what's the electric field that's induced at this radius r? So let's, where r in this case, small r is bigger than big r, which is the radius of the cylinder. Later on, we're going to take the case where small r is less than big r, and we'll, we'll do this uh, separately. Solve uh, the problem first. Let's see what happens. For this, this kind of current, if a current is in this direction at time zero, time zero cosine zero is one, so you get the maximum current, and it's in this direction. We know from before that if you have a current going in this direction, that it will produce a magnetic field to the left. So this is what's happening at time zero. What happens if you go to a time where such that omega t is pi over four? Then in that case, the, the, the current, the cosine gets smaller, the cosine is maximum when the when the argument is zero, and then it gets smaller, uh, so the magnetic field gets weaker, but it still points to the left. A certain amount of time such that omega t is pi over two, we know that cosine pi over two is zero, so the current becomes zero. If you wait for a little bit more time, remember what happens to the cosine after that. It becomes negative, so that means the current starts to point in the downward direction, or it's just a, it's a negative, so it's pointing downwards, and that means it's making a, a magnetic field to the right inside the solenoid, and it's a small value. And then if you wait a further amount of time, such that omega t is pi, then the cosine becomes maximum in the negative, uh, negative, uh, the magnet, negative value, but maximum, so the current is downwards, and the magnetic field then is maximum in the, to the right. So what's happening then is the magnetic field inside this, this cylinder, inside this coil, is changing with time. So we know that when you have a changing magnetic field, what does a changing magnetic field? It means a changing magnetic flux. And if you have a changing magnetic flux, remember what does that do? It will induce a non-conservative electric field. So this problem, we're trying to find this induced non-conservative electric field due to this changing magnetic field. So remember we said we're going to use the, the, the formula for the ideal solenoid, even though we drew it here to be very small, but imagine it's like a very long solenoid, and we're good with that we can use this approximation that the magnetic field is mu node ni. n is the number of turns per unit length, and i is the current in the wire. So we're going to write it as b as a vector as mu node ni in the u hat direction. So what does that mean? We, let's define the u hat direction. It's a unit vector pointing to the left. Because when the current, when the time is zero, 
cosine zero is one, that means the current is upwards, then the magnetic field is to the left. So this will show you, when you put this U hat here, it means that the magnetic field is pointing to the left when the time is zero. Because when cosine zero is one, then the magnetic field is, this is all a positive quantity, so that means it's pointing in the U hat direction, which is to the left. As time goes on, the cosine can become negative. So that means sometimes it's pointing in the direction of U hat and sometimes it's pointing opposite the direction of U hat. So the magnetic field vector B, it's just changing with time. Sometimes it's pointing to the left, sometimes it's pointing to the right. This is just a way to write it as a vector. Okay, so if we solve the problem, we have to first make a contour and make elements of length going around the contour, the ds vectors, and make a relation between the ds vectors and the da vector, the element of area on the surface of this circle. So we're going to choose to take the ds going this way. If you put your fingers in the direction of the ds vectors this way, then the area vector will point to the right. So this is the way the ds and the da vectors are going to be for our problem. You could take them to be in the opposite direction and it'll work out fine, but this is just the choice we're going to use. So we wrote down, remember, b as something in the u-hat direction, and this b was not the magnitude, it, was, it could be positive or negative, depending on the cosine. So the first thing we're going to do is, we're, we're going to ask what is integration of b dot da? What's the magnetic flux through this closed contour, this closed contour? Okay, so we can substitute b to be b in the u-hat direction, and then take it, dot it into d. So remember, the u-hat direction is pointing to the left, and the da vector is pointing to the right. So what's the dot product between these two vectors? It's the magnitude of the first, which is 1, times the magnitude of the second, which is da, times cosine of the angle between them, which is 180 degrees. So this is just da times minus 1. Okay, so the minus, I can take it out and we can get then integration of BDA. Now, we're going to assume that this is an ideal solenoid, so the magnetic field is constant everywhere inside, and it's zero outside. So anywhere here, there's no magnetic field. Inside, it's uniform. Outside here, it's zero. So this integration then is going to be ba basically only non-zero over the area of the cylinder, pi r squared. So the magnetic field in that region, we're going to assume it's constant, we can take it outside of the integration. So this integration of dA, and we said that this area that we're talking about is which area? It's the area that's inside this cylinder, the pi r squared, because there's no magnetic field here in this region, it's empty space. There's no magnetic field, it's an ideal solenoid, there's no magnetic field outside. So the area here is basically pi r squared. We're just going to keep writing it as a and mention that it's pi r squared and then we'll substitute it a bit later. So here it's b minus b times a and remember that the area is pi r squared. So if we substitute this into the Faraday-Maxwell equation, which gives a relationship between the non-conservative electric field that's produced and the rate of change of magnetic flux in this form. So we got the magnetic flux, integration of b dot dA, we showed it's minus b times a and area is pi r squared. So the minus and the minus will uh, cancel, of course, and we can then put substitute the value of the magnetic flux to be minus b times a, and the minus and minus are going to cancel, and we have to substitute a by pi r squared, big R. And so we get this relationship, the minus and minus cancelled, and you get on the right-hand side pi big R squared times db by dt. Now the left-hand side is going to be integration of e dot ds. Now we're going to just write this as e times the circumference of the circle. If the electric field is going around this way, then e dot ds is just e times ds times cosine of the angle between e and ds. And since the angle is zero, if the electric field goes around in circles, then the, the angle is zero, so cosine zero is one, so you just get e times this length. And this whole length is just two pi r. So, of course, there's no reason for the electric field to be different at different locations. The electric field is constant from symmetry. Why would the electric field here be different than the value of the electric field here be different than the value of the electric field here? It should be the same value everywhere. So that's why E dot ds becomes E ds, and E goes out of the integration, so you get E times 2 pi r. 
Now, if it turns out that uh, the right-hand side is positive, then E is in the direction of DS. If it turns out the right-hand side is negative, then E is just opposite the direction of DS and E is negative. So E is in the opposite direction of DS. So writing it this way, if E is positive, then E is in this direction. And if E is negative, then E is just opposite. Okay, so that's very easy. So now, what is dB by dt? And just before we do that, can you make an argument why the electric field has to be going around in this loop uh, a lot, per parallel to the ds vectors at all, loc at all locations? Why doesn't it have a component that's pointing outwards? Try to think about this and see if you can figure it out. So what is dB by dt? Well, before we do that, we just re re simplified the equation and brought the, the 2 pi r down. And so we have the 1 over r squared, 1 over r dependence then of the electric field. So the electric field, as you go to further and further distances, it becomes weaker by as 1 over r. Now, what's dB by dt? Well, we know that B is mu naught ni, and it's mu naught ni max cosine omega t. If you take the derivative with respect to time, what's the derivative of cosine omega t? It's minus omega t, and then you have to multiply by what's inside with respect to time, so you get another omega. So this is what dB by dt is. If you substitute it into here, you'll get what the electric field is. So this is what the electric field is at a radius r. The dependence on r is that it goes like 1 over r. And then everything else, these are constants. And then you have the sine omega t will change sine as, sine, as time goes on. So this is the final result for the electric field at a radius r, where r is bigger than the radius of the cylinder. Uh, when e is po remember the sign, it, sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative. So when the sign is positive, then this term is positive, but then you have a minus, so the electric field is negative, and what that means is that it's opposite the direction of the ds vectors. When the sign is negative, then this term is negative. When you multiply by negative, you get positive, then the electric field is in the same direction as ds. So you can see that this is making an oscillating electric field. And this is actually the idea behind uh, charging, remote wireless charging of devices. If you put a wire in the place of this contour, remember we said you don't have to have a wire here, but if you put a wire here in the place of this contour, the electric field in the wire will be oscillating with time. And so basically you're inducing electric field, an electric field around this wire without having any physical contact between the wire here in the base and the wire here in the object that in the device you want to charge. So this is the actual principle of wireless charging. So what if you want to get the electric field uh, along the radius, uh, at the radius r, but the radius r is less than the radius of the cylinder? The, everything will be exactly the same. If you write down the equations, everything is exactly the same, except the area, what is this area now equal to? Remember, the, the, you're going to, you, when you get the magnetic flux, you get the magnetic flux through the contour, through the area that's, sub, that's enclosed by the contour that you have. So it should, the area that we're talking about now should be this area. So the area now, in this case, will be pi small r squared. And that's the only difference then between this case and the other case. So we put pi small r squared, and notice here we have an r squared then, and we have an r. So the dependence turns out to be proportional to r. So the electric field in the case where you're inside the cylinder, the electric field is proportional to r. It gets bigger at, at zero, at r equal to zero, it's zero. As you go bigger and bigger, it gets larger and larger. This is what the electric field looks like inside the, the cylinder. We know dB by dt, we got it before, so we just plug it in, get the value of the electric field to be this value. And this is what it is as a summary. So again, the electric field has a different r dependence when you're inside the cylinder, compared to what it is when you're outside. When you're inside the cylinder, it's proportional to r. When it's outside the cylinder, when you're outside the cylinder, it goes like 1 over r. The other dependence is pretty much the same, and you get the same effect. The electric field oscillates with time. Sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative, according to the sign. If it's positive, then it's in the same direction as ds. If it's negative, then it's opposite the direction of ds. So the electric field oscillates, keeps on going backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. So this is the summary of the whole problem. The electric field 
um, when you're outside for r bigger than r it goes like one over r it gets weaker with distance as one over distance when you're inside when r is less than r it increases linearly with r now when you come to solve problems in a homework or an exam you don't have to go through all what we just did and getting the ds vectors and getting the da vectors i did it in detail so you can see how it's done once and for all but once you know how to do it then you can just solve the problem simply by writing this straight away we know that the left hand side is going to be e times 2 pi r for any case whether you're inside or outside it's always e times 2 pi r so that's easy and then the right hand side it's the rate of change of magnetic flux. If you're not interested in the, in the sign, you can just write this directly like this and forget about the sign. You don't have to do the ds vectors and the da vectors and get everything. If you're just interested in the magnitude, it's just simple to write this down straight away. You want the rate of change of magnetic flux. And the area is always a constant. So you just take it outside and you only get db by dt. So you get db by dt times the area. The only trick is which area to talk, what you're talking about. If you're getting the problem for r bigger than r, for the big loop, then the only region that has a magnetic field in this problem is inside the solenoid. That's the region where you have a magnetic field. So that's why the area in this case is pi big r squared. Because this part doesn't have a magnetic field for an ideal solenoid outside. Now, if, you have, if you're getting the electric field inside where r is less than big r, then uh, you're getting the magnetic flux through this small loop, through the whole loop. And the area of this loop is just pi small r squared. So you have pi small, small r squared. So it just depends if you're getting outside or inside, this area will be different in, the, in both cases. So when you come to solve problems or in an exam, you, just, you can just write this directly. You don't have to go through that derivation that we did before.